Hello and welcome to this session in which we would look at step three in the revenue recognition process and that is transaction price. In the prior recordings, we looked at identifying the contract that was step one. In step two, we identified the separate performance obligation or obligations. Here, we're going to determine the transaction price. And obviously, we're going to work part four and part five in future recording. What is the transaction price, which is part three of five of the revenue recognition process? Well, it's how much you're going to be going to record from, for the revenue. So you did the work. You have a contract with someone. What is the price? Well, oftentimes, most of the time, it's a pretty straightforward transaction. For example, you want to buy a car. They will tell you what the price is. You pay it, and that's the transaction price. So it's the consideration expected to be received from a customer. How much do you expect to be received? Now, this amount is easy to figure out if the price is fixed. The price is clearly stated and there's no contingencies, nothing else. Now, bear in mind, the price does not have to be specific. In the real world, you can put conditions, you can put considerations, variable consideration, other things, but you have enough information to assign a price. It doesn't have to be specific, but you have enough information to determine a price. So some contract will have those conditions, will have those variable consideration, will have some sort of a factor that's going to influence the price. And those factors are variable considerations, one, time value of money, two, non-cash consideration, three, consideration paid or payable to customer. And if you know anything about Professor Farhad, once you have a list and I number I numbered that list, I'm going to go even over each aspect of this list. Let's start with variable consideration. Well, what is a variable consideration? It means the price is dependent upon some future event. So you don't know what the final price is, but the final price is dependent upon some event happening or not happening. An example will be a good example, performance bonus. For example, your bonus, you're gonna get a bonus, but that bonus is dependent upon some delivery criteria. Okay. So the company can estimate the amount of the variable consideration to determine the revenue. So what you will do, you would say, okay, I don't know what that final price is because it depending about, it de it's, it's depending about some future event, but I can estimate the amount of this variable consideration to determine my transaction price. Specifically, we use two methods in determining the variable consideration. One is called the expected value and the other one is called the most likely method. Before we proceed any further explaining the expected value and the most likely method, I would like to remind you whether you are a student or a CPA candidate to take a look at my website, farhatlectures.com. I don't replace your CPA review course. I don't replace your accounting course. My motto is saving, helping CPA candidate and accounting student one at a time by providing you with resources, lectures, detailed lectures, multiple choice, true, false questions. This is a partial list of my accounting courses, advanced, intermediate, governmental, managerial, auditing, you name it. My CPA resources are aligned with your Becker, Roger, Lewiley, and Gleam. So it's very important to go back and forth between my material and your CPA review course. I give you access, in addition to the multiple choice questions for each course, to 1,500 previously released AI CPA original questions with the detailed solution. Those questions appeared on prior exams. If you have not connected with me on LinkedIn, please do so. Take a look at my LinkedIn recommendation. Like this recording. Share it with others. It helps me tremendously. Connect with me on Instagram. I'm trying to grow my Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit. So what is the expected value? Well, the expected value is the probability weighted amount and the range of possible considerations. So simply put, we can estimate different probabilities for the outcome. And we're going to go ahead and calculate that probability, that weighted amount probability. When do we use this method? We, we use this method, the expected value, when the company have past experience with similar work. So they have past experience with similar contract and the company in the past, they had many, they did many work with similar characteristic. What does that mean? It means when they estimate, when they estimate those probabilities before they weigh them, when they estimate them, they have good experience with that. They can rely on that experience. And simply put, the probabilities can be based on limited number of discrete outcome and probabilities. Simply put, you're just going to have to assign probabilities, percentages, and they should add up to 100%. This is when you would use the expected value. The most likely method, it's the single most likely amount in a range, in a range of possible consideration outcome. So you have con consideration outcomes, more than one, and what's the most likely outcome? When do we use this method? Well, when we have actually binary outcome, two outcome. The contract has only two possible outcome. Either 
this outcome or that outcome. Now, each outcome will have a different possibility. For example, outcome A, you're going to get the bonus 70%. Outcome B, you're going to get the bonus 30%. We'll, we'll go with the higher probability, but it has only two outcomes. If that's the case, if it's a binary outcome, you go with the higher consideration. So let's take a look at this example. Maze enters into a contract with a customer to build a, web, the website, a website for 20000 And within that contract, there's a performance bonus of $2,000 that will be paid based on the timing of the completion. We know the contract is 20000 but that's not the final price. The final price, you might have a bonus, and that bonus could be up to 2000 depending on when you would complete the project. The amount of the performance bonus decreases by 10% for every 10 days beyond the agreed upon completion date. So if you don't deliver on time, for every 10 days it's delayed, you'd lose 10% of the bonus. Now, Maze, the company that's performing this work, is familiar with this type of work. They do websites all the time. They have this type, sorts of contract, and they know the time and required based on prior experience. And based on their prior experience, based on the amount of the work required, based on their staffing availability, they can estimate how long it's going to take them. So therefore, what they would do is they will build this table. There's a 60% possibility they're going to be on time. There's a 30% possibility they're going to be 10 days late, and there's a 10% possibilities they're going to be 20 days late. Now what we do is we're going to compute the outcome. We'll take 20,000, which is the contract price, plus under 60% outcome, we're going to receive 100% of the bonus, which is $2,000. Therefore, the gross contract is 22,000. For the 30%, if you are 30, if you are uh, late 10 days, you're only gonna, you're gonna lose 10%. So it's the con you're gonna get the contract amount plus 2,000 times 90%. So it's 1,800. The total is 21,800 if that materializes. And there's a 10% chance you're going to be 20 days late. If you're 20 days late, you're going to get your 20,000. Plus, you're going to lose another 10% of the bonus, which we're going to make it 1,600. So you would get 21,600. Now we're going to weigh the amount based on the probability. The 22,000, there's a 60%. We're going to get this amount. That's equivalent to 13,200. 30% chance we're going to get 21,800. And 10% chance we're going to get 21,600. Now what we do is we add them all up. And the weighted probability is 21,900. Now if the performance bonus is binary, what does that mean binary? Binary it means we have two outcome. Either we will, we will, or will not earn the bonus. So what we do is go with the, we'll go with the most likely outcome. So if the most likely outcome, okay, so Maze earns either the two thousand for the completion of the agreed up, upon date, or get nothing if they don't complete it. If there's a sixty percent chance we are going to complete this, okay, there's a sixty percent chance. It means there's a high probability we are going to get this on time. We're going to go with that higher, the highest probability, 60%. 60% will give us exactly 22,000 if that's the case. So if the, the most likely outcome is yes, we will. So the most likely outcome, we will earn it. Either we will, okay? If that's the case, we'll go with we will because it's 60% chance we will. Therefore, we'll go with 22,000, most likely outcome. When variable consideration is not allowed, when can you not compute this variable consideration and include it in your revenue. It's only, let's see when it's only allowed. It's only allowed when you have experience, we already talked about this with similar contract, and you are able to estimate the cumulative amount of revenue based on that experience. Okay, so what does that mean? It's It means there's a high probability you are not going to back out revenue. There's a high probability that you will not have to reverse revenue. Because what happened is you estimate. You estimate at 60% you will be on time. What happened if you are not on, you booked the 60% that based on that probability, you booked 22,000. Then what end up happening, you were pretty late. If you already booked 22,000, you have to go back and reverse revenue and they don't want you to do that. If the if those two criteria are not met, it means you have experience and you can estimate this amount, then revenue recognition is constrained. What does that mean? It means you wait until the project is done. The best way to illustrate this is to work an example, but the example that would work, it's going to have to be a long example. We'll do it in another recording. Now let's talk about the time value of money. What happened if you sold something and you don't get the money immediately? You sold it and you're going to be receiving either one payments or many payments at future dates. In these contracts, 
when you have future payment, future receipts of payment, what you have is you have a significant financing component because now the contract, it might be stated directly or not, it's gonna have two components. One, there's gonna be one price for the delivery component for the item that you sold. And that's gonna be the present value of the payments discounted, which is the present value should reflect, should approximate the fair value of the component. Then you have a financing component because Whatever you're paying, the payments will be broken down by a principal amount for the price of the item and an interest component. So interest component is accounted for separately. Now, let's take a look at an example. Adam Company performed consulting services for Ryan Company in the amount of $800,000 in exchange for three years zero interest bearing note with a face value of a million. So here's what happened. Adam did some work for Ryan, consulting work. Ryan says, okay, I'm going to give you this piece of paper promising to pay you a million dollars three years from now. That's it. So how would Adam account for this transaction? Because Adam is getting the, uh, is, is, uh, will need to record the revenue now, but get the payment later. So Ryan will debit notes receivable for a million dollars. This is how much we are waiting to receive. The sales amount is only 800,000. Because the sales amount, we did the work, 800,000 worth of work. So the difference is discount on notes receivable. So the difference here is this 200,000 is future interest revenue. So the 200,000, the difference is the future interest revenue we're going to be accounting for. So a year later, what's going to happen is we're going to account for some of the revenue. And it's going to be 800,000 times 7.72. Where did I get the 7.72 based on this deal? If you compute the interest rate, it's 7.72, 7 7.15 to 7.725. So I just put 7.72. So if you did for three years, you're going to be like a few dollars difference. It doesn't matter. This is just to illustrate the point. Simply put, you're going to start to turn this discount, this discount into interest revenue. So 200,000 of the deal Although I'm going to be receiving a million dollar, 200,000 of it will be interest revenue and the sales revenue only 800,000. So I have to split the deal into the delivery component, which is 800,000 and the finance component is 200,000 and the finance component, I'm going to account for this over the years. Now, bear in mind here, you have to know what's the time value of money. Also, you need to know how to discount, how to amortize a note, whether it's a notes receivable or a notes payable. This is the assumption here. The third item that we have to discuss when we are looking at revenue recognition transaction price is non-cash non -cash consideration. What is non-cash consideration is when the company receive like gifts, donations, contribution, or contribution of goods and services like labor, equipment, a piece of land as a consideration for goods and services provided. So, so you provided a service, the customer don't have money to pay you. So what they do, they give you something in return. How do you account for that transaction? Well, under those circumstances, the, the transaction price is the fair value of what is received. You look at what you are, what you are receiving, the fair value of it is how much you're going to be accounted for. The fourth item we have to be aware of is consideration paid or payable to customers. What, what is this? What is the purpose of this? Why would we pay the customer or give the customer some consideration? Well, the reason is simple. You want to offer the customer incentive to do what? Maybe to pay, to pay early or to purchase more. So this might include discount, a volume rebate. If you buy enough, we will give you a rebate. Coupons for future purposes, free product along the sale or some service along the sale free. Why are we doing so? We are doing so to encourage you to buy more from us. Well, what would that gonna do to your sales revenue? It's going to reduce your consideration received. Simply put, I remember one time I purchased a uh, a computer and I don't remember exactly how much I paid. I believe it was around a thousand dollar. A thousand dollar, then if I fill a rebate, those are no longer, you know, they no longer do that. I still remember that's long time ago. I will get a $100 back. So what happened is initially they recorded the sale for $1,000. I filled out the rebate. I send it. They send me a check for $100. Therefore, their total sales now is $900. So why did they do that? They, they wanted they wanted to encourage me to buy the computer. So they did not give me the rebate up front. They said, okay, buy it. And they were hoping the customer will not fill out the rebate. The best way to illustrate this is to work with an example with journal entries. Adam Company offers its customers a 2% volume discount if they purchase at least a million dollar worth of merchandise in any particular year. So I'll give you 2% discount, you purchase 1 million from me.
On March 31st, Aram had made sales of 550,000 to Ryan Company. So the first quarter, they already made 550,000. In the previous two years, Aram sold over a million dollars to Ryan in the period from April to December. So what, what are we saying here? I'm reinforcing the idea that you have to know your customers. You have to know that Ryan for sure will exceed a million dollars. If they exceeded a million dollars in the first quarter, companies would know, Adam would know based on past experience, based on the nature of the business, that maybe the first quarter was a slow season for Ryan. Ryan will be buying more. Therefore, we're comfortable saying, look, Ryan will get the 2% discount. Therefore, what we do is when we debit the receivable, we debit the receivable for only 98% of it. So we'll get, we'll take 2% off. So the account receivable is debited for 539,000, which is if we take 550 times 2%, that's gonna be 11,000. So this is, we take it out. We assume, we assume that Ryan is qualified for this. Therefore, we record the, the journal entry upfront. And let's assume this is the case. How much would Ryan pay us? Well, Ryan will pay us only 539,000 if Ryan did indeed exceeded the threshold. So for this sale, they would only pay us 539. Let's assume at Ryan, for some reason, their business slowed down, there was a slowdown in the economy, and what they did is they did not purchase a million dollar for the rest of the year. They're gonna have to pay us 550,000. We'll credit the receivable for only 539. Then we have sales discounts forfeited because they forfeited the discount of 11,000. Basically, this is other revenue. This is if they did not end up getting the million dollar. So this is how it works. The best way to illustrate these concepts and to, le to learn more about them is to go to farhatlectures.com and work multiple choice questions. Go to my website, invest in yourself, get a subscription, try it for a month. It will help you tremendously. In the next recording, we're going to look at allocating the price to separate performance obligation. Once again, don't shortchange yourself. Invest in your career. Accounting is worth it. The CPA exam is worth it. It will pay you dividend for years. Good luck, study hard, and of course, stay safe.